Bookaholics is a safe place for reading junkies who obsess over books, authors, bookstores, book news, and book trivia. We'll nerd out with book reviews, author interviews, our habit, and other bookish things. Here is your host, Deirdre Pippins. Hello, Veronica. Welcome to the Bookaholic podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm I'm very excited to be here being a fellow bookaholic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, as I was doing um, preparing for the interview, um, even though we had an initial chat, as I do with all of my guests, you know, you are such a multi-dimensional, multifaceted individual that I want to be able for the viewers and the listeners to get the impact of what you do in a short amount of time and not to overwhelm them. Because there's a lot of moving parts to Veronica Kieran. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with something, uh, a, a word that not a lot of people focus on. They may watch uh, Jurassic Park movies, but anthropologist is just not a word that a lot of people key in on. And I remember being in college and I was blessed to have as a professor, a, a student of Margaret Mead. So that goes to show you how long yeah. ago I was in college. Um, yeah. But uh, she was a, a student of Margaret Mead and uh, she was legally blind, but she taught us about, I can't remember, it was maybe like the anthropology of the Caribbean, maybe was some mm -hmm. loosely uh, uh, named course that I can remember after all these years. And I learned about the barrio. And I remember reading that particular book. I can't remember. Maybe it was Puerto Rico we were studying or whatever. But, you know, it uh, anthropology introduced me to another culture, which mm -hmm. is part of what an anthropologist does. So give our viewers and listeners the good definition about what is an anthropologist and what do they do. So the simplest definition is that we study people. We study what makes us human. And yes. so there are four subsets to anthropology. The most popular one is archaeology. And that was made very famous by Indiana Jones. Yeah. So when people ask me, like, oh, do you study bones? No, I don't. <laughs> That's archaeology. Um, the other Ooh, I had it wrong, didn't I? No, Margaret Mead is an anthropologist. That was correct. Oh, no, but I had the uh, Jurassic Park. That was wrong. Oh, that's paleontology. Yeah. Paleontology. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So even further away, that's a particular subset of, um, of yeah, looking at dinosaurs history. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, and I didn't mean to interrupt you, but continue with your definition. That's okay. So yeah, no, clarity is really important. And that's the point because anthropologists are everywhere. And we're mm -hmm. also a really important part of our communities and our society, but we kind of uh, flow under the surface, which I'm, I kind of want to change. Um, and I yes. can get into why that is. Uh, yes. But so we have archaeologists like Indiana Jones. Yes. Um, most of us are not so adventurous as he is, or, you know, <laughs> fictionally is. Uh, yes. We have linguists who are interested in how language yes. shapes culture and how yes. culture shapes language. So it's a very symbiotic relationship. We have biological anthropologists, the most famous being, um, well, her nickname is Bones. I'm forgetting her real name. So the television show Bones, she's a forensic anthropologist. Yes. Uh, she would be falling in under the subset of biological anthropology. So really interested in how evolution and the physicality yes. of what we are makes us human. Um, yes. Kathy Reichs is the author of those okay. books in that show. She's the real forensic anthropologists. Um, and then there's people like me, cultural anthropologists, since so we're yes. studying living people. And yes. so that's, that's where my book comes in. And also as an anthropologist, I use my study of living people in business to help my clients hone in on their target markets, which is just another word for subcultures. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. So we, I want to bridge across that bridge and, and how you got there. So where did you study anthropology and how did you get interested in doing that? 
kind of like you said, you know, it was just a random elective course that I could take. I went to Grand Valley State University uh, in Michigan, and we had an amazing anthropology department. I and mean, we had leading experts in their fields. Uh, one of my professors had been on the History Channel multiple times. One of my other oh. professors had been on Jeopardy. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> so like very, very, very well, uh, well-known and well-renowned anthropologists. But it was simply um, a random class that I took. I took an intro to anthropology class. And I think it was in part the topic, but also in part the professor that I had. Uh, professor Van Warmer is very dynamic and mm -hmm. uh, she really likes to challenge her students and push buttons. And so one of the yes. first things I remember her doing was getting very close to us and then asking us why that made us uncomfortable. And right. our response initially is, well, because it's too close. According to whom? Because in different culture groups, body space is different. So it's body all spaces. cultural. Yeah. Um, yes. And so I really fell in love with, um, with the way that it challenges one's perceptions of the world, forces us to think wider. And of course, then I had a really uh, great professor, which, as you know, can make or break uh, the course and the topic. Most definitely. I agree with you 100 percent. And and that is <laughs> definitely can make a break. I have a son in college right now and he's going through the uh, that whole thing. A professor can make a break a, a class and your enjoyment of the class, et cetera. So, yes, that's definitely mm -hmm. part of it. Different cultures have different definitions of comfortability of space. And, you know, we Americans, I know we need our own little individual space area. I forgot how we define how close we really want to be in contact with people. But mm -hmm. my husband had always told me before I went to Europe with him that in Europe, you can sit at a table and they're going to sit somebody else beside you. So you're not going to have your little own private little table necessarily in conversation. You just may be sitting beside a rank stranger. So you got to get used to that. <laughs> so would you agree? I mean, I, th that's a great example of how culture shapes our perceptions around space and privacy. And um, I would argue that 99% of what we think of as immutable or standard or just everybody, it's mostly culture. Uh, and yeah. so I get to challenge perceptions every day, which is really fun. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, let's get into your book that is called The Stories of Elders. And let's talk about the study of these people. Tell us about this project. Yeah. Um, so it came about while I was running my tech company. So I was already an, a, an entrepreneur at the time. Okay. But because I was in tech in the mid teens, technology was really changing a lot. I mean, it still is, but it was accelerating. And I could tell that it was affecting my sense of society. Um, and I knew that we were about to lose something really. Now, my particular subset of anthropology, cultural anthropology, is studying paradigm shifts. So I want to understand how a paradigm shift affects our culture and our society and our, our understanding of who and what we are. Okay. So the, techn the technological revolution is a massive paradigm shift, and we're still yeah. in it, really. Yes. Um, you know, with the advent of AI and yeah. uh, self-driving vehicles are still rolling out. You know, we have so much of this happening, but it's yes. not going to slow down, I don't think. No. No, so no. Um, I really wanted to understand, okay, how are things changing? But to me, if I were to ask people my own age, it's a guess. If I were to ask reporters, it's what is called secondary research. I'm asking people who have talked to other people, but mm -hmm. I'm not getting the data for myself. Right. I wanted to hear it from straight from the horse's mouth. And to me, yeah. the only people who could really say how the high tech revolution, which is maybe the past three or four decades, mm -hmm. has been affecting us, humanity, and in this case, yes. I focused on the United States, are the people that lived before the high tech revolution because you need something to compare to. Yes. So yes. that's 
the impetus of why it's called Stories of Elders, why I went to the greatest generation to talk about technology, not something that most people might assume would be a authority figure. But if you're talking about how a paradigm shift is affecting humanity, this is exactly the group that you need to speak with. Yes. And so true that this hits a button for me because I'm in a um, civic group. And one of the things I want to tackle, we have to do projects and we have to study, you know, it's not just events that we have to produce for this particular group. We actually have to have some inputs, some outputs, et cetera. And we uh, have a, a special delivery model of the different uh, statistics that we have taken. What was the results of everything of this project? And one nice. of the things we want to tackle is uh, crossing the digital divide. That's what we want to work on. And mm -hmm. so, again, it's surrounding the elders and getting them to bridge to become mm -hmm. more, you know, digital natives, as, as it were. Your generation is keyed in on digital uh, technology, et cetera. And don't have to, it's not a whole evolutionary thing to some degree, but right. for someone who's elderly, it's a massive shift of yes. the way they think, the way they interact. Case in point, telephone. So even yeah. I, who I'm in the middle between yourself and so the people that you study, um, when I was a teenager, I would get on the telephone. Right. And with my friends and it was not even a handheld phone. It was the rotary dial phone um, and for a long time. And then it was the other type of phone that right. you could walk around with. You know, that was really cool. No cord to hold you to a phone. And we talked to boys for hours and hours and hours on end and to our girlfriends from hours and hours and hours on end, you know. And, you know, th that was just the whole thing. And that's how we started relationships. That's how our dating started. Our dating started on the telephone, not on the computer, you know? And so, <laughs> so it's just a whole thing. And my husband and I often talk about, wow, for example, my parents wouldn't believe what's going on in the world as far as technology is concerned. They've been deceased since the nineties, but if they were to come back, let's just say, just to pretend yeah. situation, the, the folks would be blown out of their minds. So mm -hmm. and it's, it's the same with just the existing elders right now. So what are some of the findings that you came, uh, came from your stories with the elders? Yeah, I mean, you're hitting the nail right on the head because I spoke with people who grew up with witnessing the first radio go into their neighborhood. And now there's a phone that is a phone and a video recorder a tape recorder, you know, um, a yes. playback machine, a yes. camera. Yes. Um, it's it's so many things. I was I was recently at the technology museum here in Berlin, and I went room to room, and it was a room full of the evolution of the uh, cameras, and then it was a room full of the evolution of recording equipment for the news, and there was a room full of the evolution of the computer, and there were there were like six or seven rooms of the evolution of these different technologies. I held my phone up, and I was like, literally, all seven of these rooms are right here in my hand. That oh, is insane. Wow. And so, oh, what you're wow. saying, like, to to have lived through this evolution is incredible. But yeah. then, to your point. Um, we're still, even people younger than me are still learning boundaries around this technology and it's yeah. causing problems because yeah. we don't necessarily understand how to manage family dynamics on a micro level, but on a macro level, how do we manage elections on this right. technology, right? Mm -hmm. So we as a society and as a culture are still trying to find the boundaries uh, and how to utilize this tool rather than having it use us. Um, right. And that is up to sometimes the technology builders, uh, depending on what their motives are. So when I was speaking with the elders, what they were saying was not technology is bad. They were fascinated with it. Wow. What they were saying was we really need to worry about our boundaries and intentionality because we can see 
the things that we're losing, like children aren't playing outside anymore. Right. Or my, my grandchild can't read a, uh, um, uh, the clock with the hands on it yes. or, or yes. cursive writing. Yes. And so what's being lost? One woman, she told me she brought her grandson to the World War II Museum and she was standing there reading the letters from the soldiers and the boy couldn't read them and he had to be read them. And he was 12. So he was plenty old enough to have been taught cursive, but he wasn't taught yes. it because it had been sunset in the schools. And so there's concern not uh, overwhelmingly, it wasn't being thrown the baby with the bathwater. It was right. concern for boundaries and for intentionality for this yes. new tool. And it's developing so fast that we haven't had the chance to catch up societally and culturally. Right, right, right. Such a very good point. And it's something that I've thought of, you know, many, many times uh, before. Now, how did you go about uh, gaining this information for the stories of the elders. I think you said maybe you drove about 12,000 miles or. Yes, it was, it was 11,800 and some odd. So I just rounded up because, you know, <laughs> it was a lot. That's a few, um, that's a few miles. Yeah. So I, I, um, I covered the continental United States. Um, I didn't visit every state. I got about 30 states and my goal was really to get as, um, as close to a fair demographical representation of America into the book. So I mm -hmm. talked with Native Americans. I talked with LGBTQ elders. I talked mm -hmm. with people of color. I talked mm -hmm. with white men and women and stay-at-home moms and working parents and, and right. childless people. So I really worked yeah. as much as I could to get this kind of demographical representation of the United States. And that's why I went on the road. Yes. I also went on the road because I was interviewing a group of people that weren't used to FaceTime or Zoom. Remember, I did the interviews in 2015. Oh, so okay. this was pre-pandemic, Yes. first of all. I yes. was cutting edge as a millennial go taking my business fully on Zoom in 2018. Yes. Before yes. that, I did the interviews. And so very few, some, but very few of the elders I spoke with were using FaceTime or Skype and they were loving it. They, they could see their grandchildren yeah. every day. It yes. was beautiful, but I knew I had to go to them in person if I was going to do an interview that was usable and gain their trust. Right. Very important as an anthropologist. Yes. Yes. yes most mm -hmm. definitely. I definitely trust is very important in your field. And so how did you select you? You told me all the varieties of people that you interviewed, which was wonderful. How did you come about selecting people? How did they say, come to say, yes, I will tell you this information. Yeah. Great question. Um, so I used what's called snowball sampling. And so oh. I spoke with the people in my own network. And then from there, the people that I was connected to, I then asked them for further referrals. And so as time went on, I reached further and further outside of my personal network, which was a goal, right? Because mm -hmm. if I only talk to people I know, then that's a very specific cultural subset. Um, mm -hmm. And so I snowballed my ask in order to get to people that I never heard of, never met. I found people um, a little bit through social media. Like I interviewed a woman's grandfather and she found my, my call for interviewees on Reddit. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I had, I had a few very interesting connections that way, but 90% of interviews that I did were through snowball sampling alone to help me get as far and wide as possible outside of my own, uh, my own subculture. And I mean, you really went there. I mean, so just to say you went to Native American reservations eventually. Wow. I mean, that just shows how through the snowballing, how connected mm -hmm. we we really are and can be. Yeah. I mean, I did. I did in the snowballing notice if there was a gap and mm -hmm. then make that ask particularly. So I would say, you know, do gotcha. you know anyone of this age group who would be willing to speak with me? And also in particular, I'm noticing this gap. So if you know anybody in that space and, you know, sometimes I would get, 
a referral filling the gap. And sometimes I wouldn't, but that was part of my, um, I felt my responsibility within, within the ask process. Yes, yes, yes. Fantastic. Now let's jump over to, like I said, you're a multidimensional <laughs> person and go over to your business side. Um, not that this wasn't business in a sense, but you help entrepreneurs and, and, and mind you, like you've told us, this is the study of people, but you gone to entrepreneurs to help them scale their business. Okay. So tie in your anthropology to scaling business for entrepreneurs. Yeah. I mean, it's so simple. It's simply that um, culture is a market marketing personnel call cultures and subcultures markets and target markets, the right. niche, for example. So um, I've been trained to, see groups of people in a kind of a laser focus, almost x-ray manner in order to understand how they are relating to each other and what's motivating them. And now I was trained it in order to use it to study peoples and to help our understanding of humanity, which I continue to do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, I, I current, have a current study right now um, that we're yeah. in data analysis for, but within entrepreneurship, it's a, it's kind of a superpower. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, so I help my clients with their markets and target markets. And then I, as I mentioned before, um, anthropology really is adept at challenging perceptions because we like to get into our cozy comfort zones and think that the whole world is the same as me. And there's nothing right. more. We know this logically isn't true, but, right. um, it sometimes takes an anthropologist to kind of like shove you off that cliff. Right. Um, and so I'm also very good at that with my clients when they feel like they're stuck in, in a rut mm -hmm. in their business. Um, and especially when they're at the point that they need to scale, there's usually some sort of stuckness there and some mm -hmm. belief about how business should look. Right. So they're inside that box mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I say, mm -hmm. okay, but there's all these other businesses, which are their own cultures um, right. there's other ways of doing, and you also can make up your own if you would like to. And so that's yeah. where, um, my, my area of study becomes really handy, both in the markets and getting people outside of their boxes. Yes. Yes. You know, and to use a word scale or scalability, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of like, um, even though the definition is correct, that's kind of like an internet buzzword. You see all kinds of internet gurus talking about, I can help you scale your business, scale this, scale that, you know, and it's like, okay, well, what, you know, at first, when you first heard that, it was like, well, what are they talking about scaling your business? But anyway, you know, the, internet wise, they're talking about ex exponentially just blowing up your business and just taking you from zero to whatever astronomical mm -hmm. number that they are you know, right. you know, pretending that they can help you with. So right. how do you separate yourself from those people that really are exploiting that definition and the whole internet thing? You know, what realistically the scalability mean to mm -hmm. Veronica Kieran and her company? Yeah, love it. Uh, and you're right. There's a lot of um, uh, people who like to say that they know. Um, and, and there's a lot of... Um, gurus. Unfortunately, that word has been appropriated. I don't love it. Um, and, and people who like to say it's a simple formula. Here you go. Wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I totally missing out on the person and what they actually want. Right. So um, first of all, I'm different because I've done it. So I sold my tech company a few years ago. And once I had scaled it, I went from working 70 hours a week to 10 hours a week. I legally oh. documented in the sale I was working 10 hours a week. Which brings me to my second point. If scaling means exponential growth, the business owner has to get out of the way of the business in order to have that growth. So yes. I'm keen on the internal operations in order to get business owners to that 10 hour work week. 
because then you're scalable. So yes, that makes you scalable. It means you can take on more business. Your income will absolutely go up. Your impact will absolutely widen, but your Mm -hmm. life will also, also get better because you're no longer the bottleneck in the business trying to basically drink from a fire hose. So we can turn the fire hose on full blast and you can sit, you know, drinking martinis or whatever you do when you're, (laughs) when you relax on a beach, you know, whatever the life you want you now can have because you've yes. scaled. So that's that's what I'm into when it comes to scaling. Yes. Well, backstory, my husband and I own a home health company and we've owned it since 2005. And we've gone through hill, dale, valley, oceans, continents, mountains, outer space and back to earth again to do what you just said. It took many, 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 many years for us to get to this point. And that's how I'm even interviewing you because I don't work 70 hours anymore. Uh, I probably work 10 or maybe less hours a week in that particular business. Now it took, that was grueling. It was like I said, that was 2005 to now that was grueling. So I would say to any entrepreneur that's listening to this podcast or watching this YouTube video, is that may give Veronica Kieran a try so that you won't have to go through all those years that I just described, you know, um, touch and go here and there. It works for one minute, doesn't work another minute. It is more formulaic of what you are talking about. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm grimacing because I was there. I was at burnout. There was absolutely a week I did not get out of bed and thought about giving it all up. I, I call it, I, I was really considered committing business suicide. I was just like, I had a dream. I had a vision. Apparently it's not possible. So I'm going to give up on my identity and my whole belief system and my value system and everything. I mean, that's, right. that's, I know you've, from what you just told me, you've been there and it's an yes. awful place to be. And yes. it breaks my heart because I see it happen constantly. 70% of small business owners burn out. That's, yeah unconscionable. So that's why, that's why I do what I do. Perfect. Now give um, everybody some example that if we, if they came to you for business, uh, tell us about the different uh, courses you offer and services that you offer. Yeah. So I, I certainly do private coaching. I'm really picky about how many clients I take on though, because private coaching is not so scalable. It's, it's, one-to-one, you know, time for money. I have an international academy and mastermind group called Scaling Lab. And so again, I'm practicing what I preach. I want to be scalable for myself because I I don't want to give 70 hours a week again. Um, So Scaling Lab is where you can get into my courses, my library of over 30 guides of how to implement scaling in your business and reach a community that is also working to scale we're very keen on strategic partnerships and relationships. And so I'm always in there connecting people and helping them figure out how to help each other amplify their businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I also have a yearly retreat, which <laughs> on the date of this recording, we just launched early bird um, seats for what I call empire, uh, okay. which is a retreat week long in Croatia. It's the only rapid scaling retreat in the world. And so we, in one week, completely change the structure of your business. We go in there basically surgically and spend each day pulling it apart, restructuring it in the way that got me to 10 hours. And then in the evenings, we go tour the lavender fields or the emperor's palace and have a really grand old time. (laughs) Wow. That sounds great. Oh, I'm... (laughs) I don't know. You might see me in Croatia. Well, we'd love to have you. I mean, gosh, especially a wow. fellow bookaholic. I'm I'm here for it every day. Wow. Oh my goodness. That sounds fantastic. So um were there any other uh oh that you said about how the courses is part of the scaling lab? Scaling lab. Yeah. Okay. Now, yep. And you can of- find all of this on my website. I make it as easy and transparent as possible. Good. And so what kind of price points are we talking about? So scaling lab is what I call my lipstick offer. And so uh, in in the marketing world, in a recession, uh, there's always that kind of like luxury item you'll still spring for like the Chanel lipstick. So even if you are on a budget, there's still that one thing. I want people to be able to access scaling and have it be demystified, not the like guru formula, you know, 
punching bag. I don't know what system. I want you to feel like you can get in and get the support and get custom. And so that's uh, below 100 a month. Okay. Empire on the other end though is mid mid four figures to attend. Right. Um, right. And so, and my private coaching is also within that range too. Right. So right. Um, I also offer a free webinar though each month okay. because just like you said, there's a lot of like misperceptions about what scaling is and should do for a business. And mm -hmm. so We've all got our own way of doing it. I've got my way of doing it. That's what the webinar demystifies. So um, right. I can give you that link too for the show notes. Okay. Um, I just, I welcome anyone to ask questions, get in touch with me. Um, if they're curious, there's, I'm not here to gatekeep scaling. Right. Like, I will be as transparent and open and supportive as I possibly can within the own boundaries of my own work-life balance. Yes. Oh, I love it. I love everything you stand for, Veronica. Well, folks, if you are interested in scaling your business, as we have talked about in this video and on this podcast, I invite you to head over to veronicacuran.com. And Veronica's information from social media handles to her website and anything else she may want to share with you will be in the podcast show notes and in the video description below of the YouTube video. Wow, Veronica, you brought a lot to us today. Like I said, you're a multidimensional person. I loved speaking with you. And I just want to thank you, wow, for the groundbreaking work that you've done and what you are continuing to do for people. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me on the show. I mean, you had me at Bookaholic. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Veronica. Thank you.